Last time then we began with the first of what's going to be a series of videos looking into Entity Framework Core and we dipped our toe in the water with what is known as code first database generation which was to say I wrote c -sharp classes, a couple of them, one for author, one for book, and from those got Entity Framework to generate for me the database tables and put in the primary keys, put in the associations, the relationships between them. And that's certainly for me as a developer the way I tend to start out. And with Entity Framework Core, it seems pretty much like that's the way that Microsoft is pushing it. With Entity Framework 6, the older .NET Framework version, there was much more facilities for doing database first, where we have an existing database and we generate our classes in C Sharp from them. And that's also available in EF Core, but it doesn't seem to be quite as much in the forefront as it used to be. But that's what we're gonna look at this time. So we're gonna switch it around and go for this database first, or what's actually specifically called code first from database. So we did code first last time, now we're doing code first from database. It's a bit odd the naming, it's for historical reasons, which we'll come to in a later video, but for now, just accept it, code first from databases when we've got a database and we want to create the code. And we already have a database because I made one last time. So last time I did code first, then the database. So let's just reverse that with exactly that database. So you'll remember I created an author class related to a book class. We had a books context derived from DB context. And then I chose, although I could have used all sorts of databases to do SQLite, and so we've got this my local library.db, which was our SQLite database. And if we just take a look in there, we could see there it's got the author's table and the books table. So what I'm going to do now, slightly silly, but it just shows exactly what's going on. I'm going to reverse engineer that. So now we're going to assume we've got that database and I'm going to create the tables. So I've put in a new library. So it's just a .NET standard library db first library, I've added a reference to that from the main program that was previously using the book library. And so let's go and get that working. And this is something that we have to start using the command line for. And the command line for Entity Framework Core is actually very commonly done through the Package Manager console. There are other ways you can do it. The Package Manager console, certainly within Visual Studio, is the way that it tends to be done. So we go into Package Manager Console, and then we need to make sure that our default project is the library in which we want to actually create the classes from the database. So at the moment, it just goes to the startup project, Entity Framework, but we want to make sure that is now on our DB first library. If you just had one project, just the console or whatever, then it would be easy but that wouldn't be very good practice in terms of manageability of the code. We want to keep our database separate from our console or whatever the program is. Before we can type any commands, we've got to also make sure that the appropriate NuGet packages are installed. And can be a bit tricky, so this is essentially what we've got to do. In the library, we've got to add a few packages. So if I go to my NuGet packages, and then if we type in here, Entity Framework Core, then the ones we've got to have are Entity Framework Core itself. So we'll install that. And then one called Entity Framework Tools. So if we just do a search for that, Tools, then we can see that one in there. And thirdly, we need to have that design. So if we just install that. So those are the three that we need to have in our library as a bare minimum for this. Core itself, design and tools. And then also in our main project, so that's our entity framework project, we've also got to put that design library in there. So if I just go to the package manager for there and do a quick search for design. There's our Entity Framework Core Design. Install that. And then that should give me the bare minimum that I need to make this all work. Then if I go back to my Package Manager Console, then what I need to do is use the command scaffold 
dash db context. So scaffold means create, code generate, whatever you want to call it, and db context, remember our db context is the connection point to the database. So that's what's called that. But it will be generating a little bit more than just the db context. The first parameter that I then have to put in there is the connection string. Now, remember we said this could be a SQL server, could be Oracle, but we're using SQLite. And so the connection string for SQLite just consists of file name equals, and then we can see down there, that's the name of our database. So we're going to have dot slash my local library dot db. And then the second parameter which we need is the actual provider, the type of database we're going for. So again, Oracle SQL Server, but in this case, Microsoft dot entity framework core dot SQLite. So that's the provider we're using. And if we hit return there, it'll do a build. And then it will read that database that we created with our books and our authors, and it will generate classes based on that. And we can see that in our DB first library, it has now added those three classes. So all of this is used default names, which we could have changed if we'd wanted to with various additional command parameters. I'm not going to get too bogged down in that. But if we compare it with what we wrote for ourselves with the code first, we had a books context. It's got this my local library context. But you can see if you look in there, it's pretty much identical. So there it's got the constructor with our options that we're going to be using, the two DB sets of authors and books, and then a few other bits and pieces. These things we could have put in for ourselves, and I'm not going to worry about them now. In terms of our simple application, they don't really matter, but they can matter later on. So we'll see what those mean in later videos when we get into more detail. But basically, it's done the same thing. And then also, if we take a look at the other two classes it's created, we've got a books class. So ID, title, year of publication, and author. And then authors has ID name and a collection of books, which is almost exactly the same as we had there. It's worth highlighting some of the differences. And the most obvious difference is that when we wrote the classes, we gave the classes singular names, which is a normal convention, not just in C sharp, but in all OO programming when you're dealing with classes. And it in the database generated tables with the plural name, which is the normal convention when you're dealing with database tables. That didn't happen automatically on the way back. So on the way back, when we just generated those classes, it just made the class names the same as the table names, which is an irritation. There are ways around it. They're quite complicated. I'll try and give a link to some websites that explain that, but I don't think I'll waste time going through it too much myself. But it does just show how Microsoft are kind of not putting the emphasis into this database first that they used to. In EF6, that was very easy to do. Just click a checkbox when you're doing this. But not too much to worry about. Um, other things that it's put in there, it's just been a little bit more verbose about various things. But other than that, that was the main difference. And just to demonstrate that that's all going to work, let's go back to our program now. And in here, rather than having our books context, which was the context I wrote for myself, let's change that to the generated one, which took the default name based on the database, my local library context, and get hold of the namespace. And then also, I'm just going to have to change what's going on there so that it's a DB context builder for the right thing. That all adds up OK. And actually, quite luckily, because I've made extensive use of var, the difference between the fact that previously I had classes in the singular author book and I've now moved to authors and books, actually, that's all dealt with. So we can now see our recent books is an iQueryable of books plural, not singular. So it's all coped with that quite nicely. And that just means it's really easy, because now if I run this code, we can see one slight problem there, actually, in that in the 
db context, it's actually put this code in that we don't really need. So for now, I'm just going to delete that. We will look at other ways of doing the configuration. It was just a, a reference missing there. And so now if we run that, then we can see that it's not actually working correctly. What we can see it says is db first library dot books, db first library dot authors. And the reason for that is the code I'd written simply relies on both book and author having a two string. And if you remember from the previous video, I'd put those in fairly simply, but those aren't generated for us. You can see in books and in authors, we don't have a two string. Now, we've got to be a bit careful here because these two classes are generated for us by that scaffold DB context tool. And if we ever made an update to the database and then wanted to regenerate our classes, we would basically be splatting over completely that generated code. So if we, having generated the code, start putting any functionality into it, we're running the risk that that may be lost. And that possibility has been anticipated by the fact that all of these classes, so the DB context and authors and books, have all been declared as partial. Partial is a lovely keyword in C sharp designed for exactly this situation. It means that we can put a bit more information about this class into a different file. And in that different file, that's where we can put the two string, and that will be safe. And if this file is ever regenerated, fine, but we won't lose our own code. So what we then need to do is something like this, is to say, add another class. Now, the temptation is to have a class of exactly the same name. And in fact, we do have to have a class of the same name, but what we don't want, what we can't have is a file of the same name. So if I were to try and say books and do add, we'll get an error that books already exists. And there's two ways around this. One is we could just simply have a file with a different name, but give it the same class name. So we could have a file called books additions with a class called books. But the way I prefer to do it is to use folders. So if I just add a folder in here called additions, and then into there add a class called books, that's now allowed because although it's the same file name, it's the same file name in a different folder. But then the thing to watch out for is because this is in a different folder, by default, it has a different namespace. And this books here has to be in the same namespace as that books there. So the other thing we have to do, remove that additions. So they're now in the same namespace and then say public. And we have to have partial on both fragments but now we can see the magic, because if I just do an override of two string in here, and then say return, if I were to say this dot, we can immediately see ID and title and year of publication are all just there waiting for us. Even though they're actually declared in this other books, they're available to us. And so all I need to do here, in fact, Let's be really lazy. Let's just steal that code there that I had in the original one. Pop that in there. And then a similar sort of thing for authors. So call it authors, then take off the extra bit on the namespace, then public partial. And then in this case, I'm going to do uh, override of two string and this one just returns the name which again is there so we can see that that's hooked up to that authors and now when we run the code we'll see it works exactly as it did before so remember we're filtering there on authors since 1900 so the two strings being called everything else exactly the same as it was before so things like the fact we had to include the author just the same as it was before. But in that case, we got the system to generate the classes for us based on an existing database. And we also saw how the fact that since that is generated code, it might get overwritten. So any additions we want, we put separately using partial classes. 
So there we have it for our first look at Entity Framework Core. We've seen how we can do code first, so write the code, get it to generate the database. We've seen how we can do this slightly strangely named code first from database, where we had the database, but we got it to generate the code. But it's still called code first because the code is the definitive item that tells us what we're doing. Next time, I'm going to take a bit of a step back and look at these features in EF6, the slightly older technology, and we'll see why there's another option there. And that's why we have the strange name of code first from database, because there we've got a genuine DB first. But I hope that's been helpful. If you enjoyed it, do subscribe, do ask any questions, and I'll see you next time with a look at EF6.